to Kakati Shah. I'm your host for The Uma Show. Welcome to your one-stop journey for feeling empowered. We are a platform for change. We build confidence. We are your voice. We want you all to be bold, be you, be Uma. Today, we are exploring role models in South Asian sports. And I'm so excited to be joined by our goddess of go-getting for today, Neha Ubroy, who is a former professional tennis player, and she's the co-founder and CEO of South Asians in Sports in New York City. Welcome, Neha. Thank you so much for having me. So you're from New York City, you've moved to Princeton in New Jersey. Um, you grew up in a household as one of five girls. That's a lot of girl power right there. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about your younger years and growing up with your sisters. Yeah, I mean, I think it was uh, very unique uh, to have five sisters. We had a, a one male dog that was like my dad's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think we grew up um, very unique as a first generation um, Indians. My parents really wanted to instill pride in our culture and, and our heritage. And that's not something that we saw amongst a lot of our other peers. So, uh, you know, we were always told that, you know, to be very proud of who we are, where we come from. Uh, we were given a lot of opportunities to learn about our culture, to study a religious texts and um, a really big focus on sports actually. So uh, we had a very competitive household. There was a <laughs> saying that my dad, um, you know, my, my father had made, which was no mistakes in Kumon. I don't know if you know Kumon. <laughs> oh yeah. Absolutely. But no mistakes in Kumon <laughs> and no mistakes on your forehead. Oh and my God, was, I really love that. <laughs> <laughs> and that was sort of the mantra that we lived, lived by for our younger years. Um, <laughs> where it was, my dad really wanted us to do something different, to break the mold, uh, to be athletes. And, you know, it was all about building our bodies as well as our minds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we would have to swim every day. Uh, just a very, you know, typical Desi parent, uh, applying it to both sports and academics. I love that because, you know, in South Asian households, it's really hard to actually fathom first generation parents pushing their second generation kids into the community of, of non-academic -acad careers, let alone sports. However, in your case, it was actually your father that wanted all his girls to be athletes. Um, did he know you all had sports tendencies? I mean, how did he actually encourage it? Yeah, I mean, I think we played a lot of sports growing up. We tried everything. We were really big into swimming. I mean, I, I think by the age of seven, I had played every sport that there is. Wow. Um, my father was a really big tennis fan. Uh, he went to the US <laughs> Open for 14 years in a row. I mean, just tennis. Wow. Was, yeah, and in tennis, for especially for females, is a kind of a marquee sport. It's something you can play for the rest of your life. and. He was attracted to it. We all kind of took a liking to it as well. It was sort of a family activity. And, you know, we took it from there kind of step by step. So why tennis? Definitely from my, my dad's influence. Um, and I think he really enjoyed it. And uh, also it was non-contact. And, right. and if you know now with COVID, it's also yeah. social distancing. There so you go. <laughs> there are a lot of benefits to playing the sport. And, um, you know, it was it was fun for all of us. Yeah, it's like you predicted the future almost. <laughs> it's really cool about that. So that's really good to know. So it's like your immediate family supported your sports pursuit. Um, what about other family members? Or I guess what I'm trying to get at, in our community, there's so many auntie Gs, quote unquote. Um, I remember when we first chatted um, about one thing you mentioned about family friends, and they would make comments that when you were playing tennis, they wouldn't quite get it. And in fact, it's like... Um, they would almost indicate you're like wasting your time. It's like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Getting dark in the sun. Instead of, I guess, pursuing more worthwhile pursuits, like going to find yourself a suitor or a husband or something. So I remember that was quite interesting when we spoke. So just tell me a little bit about that. Definitely, especially early on initially, you know, when we were rising the ranks and we didn't really have the results to kind of uh, be on an international stages yet. You know, we were young and, and trying and it's a very big effort. Um, our community, you know, even just my extended family was like, mm -hmm. you're getting dark, you know, how it, with Indians and dark skin and right. how are you going to find a husband? You have so many muscles. How are you going to go to college? <laughs> what about your academics? Um, what is this all for? You know, I think the basic mentality is to have a very linear um, success route and to do things that are risk averse to mm -hmm. ensure that, you know, everyone is 
settled and stable and married, you know, those are very important things to us. And my father wanted, you know, I think I attribute so much of, of kind of who I am to my father's grand vision and thinking, you know, that anyone can watch the game. How about putting my kids in it and giving it a try, you know, right. and giving it a shot against all odds. And we faced racism, we faced it all, you know, and it wasn't until we kind of made it to a certain level that our community said, oh, those are our girls, you know. Yeah, so, I find that so interesting, especially in our communities where you don't feel you get the support early on, which is when you really, really need it. But then suddenly you rise to fame and then everybody's your best friend and recounting right. stories of your childhood together. And when they were that one person there for you, you're like, wow, where were you when I needed you, I guess? Yeah, I wouldn't fault the, you know, the community for that. It's just not yeah. something that has been done enough right 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 that's, that's a good point yeah, yeah. and I, and there is some uh truth and knowledge to sticking with certain tracks and career paths and mm -hmm. you know making sure that there is that security but yeah. you know i think breaking the mold should be should be done more yeah no absolutely absolutely and i think people stick to the comfort zone a lot which is exactly to your point you know when our families our parents first moved here um, to the Western world, they're bringing with them their culture, their community, their comfort blanket. Right. So in a way, when you deviate from that, and they just want to protect the second generation, so to speak, they're not used to going outside that. So I think that's what it is. But when you do actually become successful, it's more like, well, actually, let's embrace this moment. Wow, this is, wow, this is actually pretty good, you know. I mean, even um, wearing shorts, you know, yeah. wearing shorts and, or skirts and, you know, that's a big deal. So I think, uh, you know, it took a lot of courage on my parents, both my mother and my father, right. to kind of put us there and, and keep pushing. Mm, absolutely. And you don't think of things like that until until you discuss it, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and speaking of, I guess, academics, um, you actually did go to Princeton super young. You were 16. Um, what was it like balancing an Ivy League education with being the peak of your professional tennis career? Yeah, that was a really hard, that was really hard. I mean, I, I grew up training seven hours a day, six days a wow. week. Uh, you know, school was in the evenings, uh, you know, in between protein shakes, trying to cram it all in, having my dad teach me chemistry and physics, which was, I don't <laughs> recommend, you know, <laughs> you know how it is. And, you know, it, it was really tough to kind of keep excelling or keep at pace of both but it was expected in our household it was really like there's no other if you don't get an a you're not going to play you know you're not going to go play on the court right right, so right. stepping into a place like princeton where you know the level of academia is so much higher yeah. um it was really challenging for me i was uh emotionally like much younger i was you know physically like a little bit immature, I think, right. uh, to my to my peers. And at the same time, I was trying to keep up my level of training uh, yeah. in this really tough academic setting. And um, I, I really struggled. That first year was not oh, not easy. And I knew that I was going to go in for a year and then go on the pro tour. And I was just counting down the minutes till for that year to end. But yeah. you know, I think I think I got through it. I wouldn't say I fully enjoyed it till I could kind of sit back and remember it. Uh, right. but it was tough. It was tough. And that's really good for you to share that, actually, because when we just spoke, we kind of think, wow, your parents are sort of almost liberal in the sense that they think, yes, go into sports. We're going to let you excel at that. But in no way did they say you have to give up any of the academic side first. That was the priority I guess and to your point you know doing those Kumon classes in your younger day as well you and your sisters and you're like I can't forget that memory uh, of doing that so it's almost like embedded into you that that routine that structure that discipline I guess come comes from a younger age um so thanks for sharing that yeah <laughs> so you played pro tour competed at the US Open and at Wimbledon. In fact, you reached the ranking of top 100 in the world. You also reached two WTA Tour doubles finals alongside your older sister, Shika. Wow, that is just amazing. So tell us a bit about your heyday. Yeah, <laughs> my heyday. Uh, yeah, interesting. I mean, I think pro sports looks very glamorous from the outside. Um, and you know, it was, it was a roller coaster ride. There were some really high highs. I think, you know, playing, um, in front of, uh, the Indian crowd in front of our community, that's some of the, the things that I will hold near and dear to my heart forever. Um, you know, being able to kind of, uh, entertain and compete 
it's a high that you'll never uh, kind of find anywhere else, I don't think. Uh, lows, you know, you're you're losing matches almost every week if you're not winning the tournament. Um, you know, you're growing up, you're in your mid-teens, early 20s. Uh, you've got coaches and uh, sponsors and the world watching you and critiquing every part of you, of your yeah. body, of your, you know, your performance. Uh, you have your own pressure that you've put on yourself. Of, I need to do better. I can do better. So um, I would just say it was, it was a roller coaster. It was a whirlwind of highs and lows, uh, really low lows, really high highs. Yeah. And yeah. it takes a lot of um, internal strength or, uh, you know, just sort of having a very good sense of uh, self-worth to kind of um, balance all of that and handle it day in and day out. Uh, you know, there were coaches, there were a lot of toxic people around in my environment, wow. especially in female sports. You can imagine the kind of people that are attracted to that and who was around you. I was yeah. very lucky to always have my father, to have my, my family, to have a very good, um, you know, moral kind of compass that I grew up with and to, uh, to use, you know, have my culture really strongly in my identity. Uh, right. So yeah, definitely there are pitfalls, but there were some really, really fun moments, traveling the world, mm -hmm. meeting people all around the world, meeting South Asians and Desi <laughs> in every corner of the world. Like, what are you doing? It's yeah. Lovely. Oh, we've been here for five generations, you know, like, <laughs> That was amazing to me. Oh my gosh, I can imagine. That's amazing. So it really sounds like you've experienced everything. When people talk about life lessons and experiences, you have it there as being a professional sports person and you're so young when you're doing it. Yeah. So I guess, you know, when we talk about life skills and what really equips us for later on, can you tell us a little bit about, I guess, how the training for professional sports really equips us with essential life skills. I mean, you've spoken about some of it there, but it's yeah. just tell us a bit more about that resilience and that sure. grit. I guess. Definitely, that's a great word, grit. I think, um, you know, I think grit is something that is so hard to be taught. And I think that sports or athletics really teaches you that how to get over your mind and your body, you know, how to surpass when the mind's saying no, or it's doubting and to doubt yeah. that doubt and to keep going and to push yourself. I think those are very, very critical life skills to learn at an early age that sports can give you in competition. Yeah. Another thing is putting yourself out there and being prepared to fail and getting comfortable with failure. Yeah. Uh, I think oftentimes, you know, when it's too late that you get scared, you don't want to try new things. You don't want to be flexible or adjust to life. And I think so much of life is about, um, you know, it's resilience, yes, but it's also adaptability. How flexible yeah. can you be? How can you bend? Uh, right. It's also about planning and strategy. You know, what am I doing with my day? How am I compartmentalizing the fun? Can I delay yeah. gratification? You know, how much gratification can I delay? And right. you know, those are very important life skills, I think, to learn from an early age, getting up early. I, I'm now, you know, 34 and thinking, wow, Life is so easy compared to my training days. You know, it's such a walk in the park. There are other challenges, absolutely. But like the day-to-day -day of things are just, yeah. you know, it's it's great. I can I can do it. I feel like I can do it all. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love that sort of that, that feeling. And you're right, this really equips you long term. I try to think of it in terms of just being an entrepreneur. Um and when you're starting something for the first time, you do have to have great resilience. You are told no a lot. So I guess in your terms, just getting used to that failure and not having the fear, but using it as the roadmap for success ultimately. Because if you're scared of failing, you can't do anything. And I think you've really hit the nail on the head there that that is really the roadmap that you are structured to have earlier on. So that's incredible. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, so I guess from the outside perspective, from, from us, your audience, your fans' perspectives, we see a successful South Asian woman and a role model to so many young girls out there. We see a rosy image from the outside, um, this side of the fence, certainly. But the lifestyle of being a professional athlete is totally cutthroat. It's beyond intense. And it actually impacted your health, didn't it? Um, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think... I sort of alluded to it earlier, right? You know, the highs and the lows and the pressure. I think 
it was a sort of a combination of, of uh, you know, of things for me that sort of um, broke me down to a certain yeah. extent. I think um, I had to stay very strong for a very long time. Uh, and I, you know, was in an, a very toxic coaching relationship where, yeah. uh, you know, this coach was focused on my body on me looking and weighing a certain weight, you know, things that just were actually not that relevant to my performance, but yeah. sort of his way of trying to control and manipulate me and, you know, whatever his intentions were. Mm -hmm. And that, that what happened with that is, is it sort of enmeshed itself with, this is my only way to success. If, if, I, if I don't do this, if I don't achieve this weight, this, magic number on the scale, I will be worthless. I will not win Wimbledon, you know, or I, I just won't be good enough in life, mm. which I'm sure we can all relate to, to some, right. some respect. And, you know, I was young and I didn't have the tools to, or the, um, the assurance in myself that I could speak out against this, that maybe yeah. this was wrong. Uh, you know, we had invested as a family so much of our time, our blood, our sweat, our tears financially. Yeah. You know, I just wanted to do it. And I didn't really see that it was harming me until I realized that I have an eating disorder and I need help. I have bulimia and I need help. And, uh, you know, I was very, very angry and resentful for a really long time. Like, why did this happen to me? And my parents not understanding mental health at all also didn't really understand you know it was like why are you so mentally weak that you let this thing happen to you wow and you know it took me many years to realize actually i was really strong for a really long time and i was silently suffering and not telling anybody about it mm -hmm. um and i you know i think that was probably real that was really really tough for me to kind of um accept uh yeah. and it and it took me into my 20s you know the, the kind of eating disorder piece the binging and purging and you know the weight that, that sort of disappeared when you know I kind of said okay this is this isn't even this is even sane right yeah. but sort of the lingering need for self-worth and approval that kind of mm -hmm. stayed with me for a really long time yeah. and especially when I was when I left professional tennis and you know was venturing in into my mid-20s trying to figure out who am I, what is my purpose on this planet, you know, all those kinds of existential questions. That was an incredible story. Thank you for sharing, because it's something that really affects so many people around the world, and especially adolescents, teenage girls, really. And you're right, it does go unnoticed. And there isn't that support, especially in sports. And in our, in our communities, I think a lot of South Asians just don't get it. Mental health isn't really talked about. And I think it's because of that, that led you to eventually when you retired from your professional sports career, you went on back, you went back to studying, you went on to do a master's at Columbia at the time with two children under the age of two. So that was <laughs> wow as well, like, you know, what else, bring it on. So you had to balance all of that for starters. But then you made your, it your mission actually to address mental health issues in sports, especially the transition experience with post-athletic careers. So tell us a little bit more about that. It's so commendable that that is what you did, but just love to hear about it. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so I mean, after tennis, transitioning, I, had a, I struggled a lot to find, again, purpose, meaning, passion. I was sort of looking for the same elements that you might find in a professional sporting career, uh, you know, outside of that. And I really didn't feel, uh, Rita, that I had people or mentors or even therapists around me that understood what I had gone through, who I was trying to be, and what I could accomplish. You know, it was a, a lot of people telling me, why don't you just become a tennis coach? Nothing mm -hmm. wrong with becoming a tennis coach. <laughs> yeah. But there were so many other elements to me that I wanted to uncover. I mean, I remember wow. leaving tennis and saying, you know, what color do I like? You know, do, do I like to wear pants? Like, I really didn't know who I was. And, uh, you know, finding someone who, to help guide me was just like, I have to do this for myself yet again. I have to pull myself up by myself. 
I remember going to the library, searching for stories like mine. Did other athletes have eating disorders? Did they, you know, it wasn't talked about like it has been in the last two or three years. And that was, is really what really led me to the work I'm doing now, uh, where it's, you know, using and applying my life journey to help those of right. kind of come out of it. Because I think there are so many positive aspects to doing professional sports or even collegiate sports. Mm-hmm. And I think that just having someone as a guide to help you avoid some, some of the pitfalls so you can reap all the benefits of, you know, sport, I think is so important. And now the world, or at least in the U.S., more attention is coming to that. They are seeing that athletes are a unique subset, that have unique needs, that need this type of support. So I'm really happy to be part of this kind of industry and this budding field. Uh, and it did take me going back to grad school uh, you know, <laughs> while having children, which is a lot. But again, I think it was my sports background that let me yeah. have, you know, be able to do all of that. Yeah. and do it with a smile on my face. Mm. It's incredible how you managed to balance on that and the work you're doing. Um, so now you're actually the co-founder and CEO of South Asians in Sports. So tell us about that mission. Yeah, so uh, that started in 2016. Uh, that's sort of um, the brainchild of when my sister Shikha and I were on the pro tour, not seeing a lot of people who look like us um, within the sports ecosystem, maybe not on the court or playing, but just around sports, agents, journalists, you know, um, even doctors, people of our heritage, uh, uh, you know, investing themselves in, care- in careers related to sports. And I thought, why is that? Why, why aren't we using our expertise in this field? And, and I truly believe that as a Desi community worldwide, yeah. kind of, um, I feel like sports is the final frontier for us. I feel like we've yeah. killed it in almost every profession. And I think that um, I really wanna see more and more South Asians join the, the sports industry. You know, if, if tomorrow, Rita, I wanna be a physician, I can, I can turn around and I'll have a yeah. network of Indians or Sri Lankan yeah. or Pakistanis that can, help me, guide me through the steps. But if I say I want to work um, for the NBA, it's crickets. So I'm trying to build this community of people who are passionate about sports, want to work in the business, as well as athletes, and bring them all together so we can help kind of lift each other up, as well as bring in that next generation. So we do things like panel discussions and networking events and, you know, education workshops, mentoring, Uh, job opportunities and we're we've grown to about uh, 500 members worldwide Uh, most of those who are working you know professionals working in sports Mm. so this has been a passion kind of project of mine for a couple of years now Uh, it's not my full-time job though it does take a lot of effort (laughs) but it really motivates me it's something that I get very excited about and I love you know the success stories that I see I love connecting people um, and it's sort of like my playground where when I want to try things or develop uh, personally, I kind of use this as a medium for that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so much needed. You know, to your point, I would love it when there was were resources out there, when my two kids grow up, for them to have the outlet, the network to reach out to. So you never know, you know, you're, the way you're doing this, you are so strong in this mission um it can only succeed i just really really hope it does and it's incredible so you know well done on doing that and you are just so inspiring neha i have to say (laughs) so before we actually let you go any words of advice you'd like to share or give to any budding young south asian athletes out there athletes yeah keep going you know you're not going to look like everyone else your diet's not going to be like everyone else's your success is not going to look like everyone else's just keep trucking, keep going and use your heritage, use the lessons of ancient wisdom from, you know, our traditions to help you excel on, you know, in sport and in life. Um, And, you know, it is, it's hard. You don't, you don't see a lot of people that look like us doing it, but you're paving the way. So keep going and um, I'm here if you need me. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you so much, Neha, for sharing your journey with us today. 
Neha Uberai, everybody, former professional tennis player and co-founder and CEO of South Asians in Sports. And thank you to our viewers for watching on this empowerment journey today. We want you all to embrace the inner goddess of go-getting. We want you to be bold, be you, be Uma. Thank you.